You're not afraid of the dark, are you? Okay, peace. Welcome to another article um, review on the Dark Warrior Perspective channel. Of course, the Dark Warrior himself. And today's um, article that I'm going to read to you guys, I'm going to try to make this on a weekly basis because I'm finding a lot of interesting articles that is still relevant today that's been written, you know, several decades ago. And as my last few articles... That, that I've been reading from, you can see they've been coming out of the Black World by the Johnson publication. This one in particular was dated in 1972, 47 years ago. You got the late Carter G. Woodson on the um, on, on the um, the cover of the magazine. But when I began reading the magazine, I just I had come across an article that I thought would be very interesting to you guys because because this subject matter. Is continuously surfacing so it just lets you know it's not it's nothing new so I'm going to do my best to try to you know create these these articles for you guys every week so you can tap into the um, to the past just like I have uh, you should know by now I I'm really enjoying uh, what the earlier writers and of our Africana history has been about so no further ado let's get to it because I'm going to, tr I don't want to keep you guys too long. It's normally about an hour reading, but be patient with me, okay? So, 1972, dated February, of the Johnson publication. Carter G. Woodson's on the front. So I go in, and um, I read a really good article. As you can see, this is, let me, let me increase the size for you. The Inquiry into Race Concepts, you know, I'm, I'm through Spanish Literature. And it was written by Martha Cobbs on page 32. All right. So when I clicked on it, I was like, all right, let me see what Martha Cobbs is talking about. And voila, here you have the Arab, the Afro-Arabs, Black Amores, and Blacks. Now, we know that this has been coming across uh, the, the feed and through uh, many debates on, on various YouTube um, you know, uh, channels for quite some time. So I wanted to read this article to you, and hopefully it kind of bring, brings some of you who may not be aware of it and some of you who are. But before I, before I get started, I want to say this, man, and I really mean this from the bottom of my heart. Some, some, some of you ladies and gentlemen out there need to be a little bit more honest in your, in your studies of history. Some of you are a little too disingenuous in studying history. You're cherry-picking history. So it can it can validate your platform, and I keep reiterating this, and and and, and I have to, because so it's you're cheating, um, you're cheating history in the in the, in the sense that you may not be proud of whatever happened in history, or you may see something a little bit more uh, enlightening, or something that's more attractive, something that's more appealing, right? So the whole thing about the Black Amores I always found interested in because some of it is not really, it's, it's half truth and it's half false. So when I was reading the article, The Afro-Arabs, Black Amores, and Blacks by Martha Cobb. And Martha Cobb went on to say, you know, for a long time, history and literature dominated by the, the uh, orientation and attitudes of European scholarships have conspired to hide the impact uh, that Africa once had on the development of culture and civilization. To deny this past is to ignore a significant part of both African and European history. To be unaware of the constantly changing human relationships of the past that have evolved into attitudes and concepts about black people in the modern world. From ancient times, Spain served as a bridge between Europe and an, an Eastern world whose cultural crossroads was Africa. Situated at the extreme southeast of the European continent, 
the Iberia Peninsula very nearly touches Africa in the Straits of Gibraltar. Okay? Bearing out this reality, we can see in the Iberia Caves in the southeast of Spain a treasury of stylized drawings of African origin that represented men and women and animals. These sophisticated drawings of figures and movement are focused on the central themes of hunting and dance. On the other hand, the, um, the Altamira Caves in the north of Spain are found the simpler drawings of animals on the walls that are European in origin. It is interesting to note that the scholars now admit that this is the representation of African origin on the walls of the southeastern Alperia Caves, which are the first cultural documents of European life rather than those that lack human figures found in the northern Altamira Caves. Successive waves of human beings entered Spain, but the indigenous population was composed of the Iberians, a dark people considered to be of African origin. A fact that the caves of Iberia sustained the people who are the concern of this study, however, were the Moors who came into Spain in 711 AD, defeating the Visigoths and initiating a struggle between Christianity and Islam that lasted until 1492 with the triumph of the Catholic monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella. During this time, a second Moorish invasion under the African general Yusuf in the 11th century extended Muslim rule for the appropriately hundred years from the Senegal River in West Africa to the Ebro River in northern Spain. Some modern writers like to call the Moorish invaders Arabs, but this term is wrong. What actually happened, as the writings of the time can testify, is that a minority of Arabs themselves, an interracial group, left their homeland to push the Muslim religion westward and to gain new lands. They converted the people in their path to Islam, the Mohammedan religion. Their converts were Africans, East and North Africans, Egyptians, men from the Sudan and the land of the blacks, others from the synagogue Berbers who gave their name to synagogue, and a mixture of many more most of whom were so dark they were called Blackamoors by the Europeans. During the Moorish domination, Spaniards themselves used the term Moors, which indicates more accurately that the invaders crossed into Spain from the continent of Africa and that it was Mohammedan Africans rather than Arabs who defeated Spain. We know this because the, the Arabs hired the northern, the converted Africans to, um, to uh, help them um, take over Spain that lasted uh, well over 800 years. Yusuf's warriors, who were drawn from both West and North Africa, were called Amerovans, which may give a linguistic clue to the origin of the term more. Myself and my good brother, um, we did a book review on this subject matter several months ago. It's on my YouTube channel. All right. Shout out to my man, Antonio Fly. He and I deliberately, slowly read what Dr. John Henry Clark talked about the Americans in the history of Africa, volume one and volume two. We did this review on you. So we're going to go back to this in a little bit. All right, and it's on my channel. As we shall see, 
Literature expresses the profound influence of these historical facts on Spanish culture and as a result through Spain on the culture of other parts of the European continent. We must bear in mind that during this uh, epic of, of uh, Islamic invasions in Moorish powers in Spain, black civilizations flourished in West Africa and extended their influence northward. The empires of Ghana, Mali, and Sungai advanced to successive heights of civilization in Africa during the dark ages of medieval Europe. Between the Africans of these empires and the Islamic Arabs, there flourished a commercial, religious, and cultural interchange which included matrimony between Arab and African and the development of education in African universities such as Timbuktu. Why do I emphasize that? It's because some people are being disingenuous to say that, well, it was some Arabs who established Timbuktu. No, there was an interchanging of an African civilization that had already existed who, had, who were intermingling with Arabs under the umbrella of Islam, which attracted scholars from all parts of the Muslim world. So many people of the Muslim world was now going to Timbuktu because it is now a what? Islamic capital with a, an African foundation. Thus, the Muslims who dominated Spain were not a homogenous people. They weren't of the same. On the contrary, to the Arabs were united the African peoples on an equal basis if they converted to Islam, otherwise enslaved if they were conquered, as many white Europeans were enslaved during the same epoch of the same reasons. Modern studies expressed in many American textbooks have eliminated references to Africans using the word Arab as if Arabs were a pure unmixed race or perhaps a white race. In neither case, this is true. One of the most distinguished Afro-Arabs honored and well-known in the Eastern world was Antar. His full name was Antar Abib Shahad, uh, Absi. When you see the word Abin, that means the one like the son of. And he lived before the Islamic era and the invasion of Spain. The son of a black woman from the African continent and a Berber era. That's the same thing about Tipotip, who started the African slave trade. On the uh, on, on from East Africa, he was both mixed with Arab and African. Antar was renowned as warrior, poet, and the ideal representative of a sh uh, sh um, chivalric code, which, according to the legends that followed his death, he formulated his mulahwa or praise song, which hung in the mosque at Mecca. It's considered a masterpiece, one of the seven golden odes of the Arab world. Typical of the poetry of these feudal times, Attar wrote about the glory of his conquest in war and love as the following lines illustrated. He wrote, before the spearmen's deadly, trust, uh, deadly thrust she tried to rouse my fears as if I were defenseless and unarmed against their spears. I answered her, now surely death is no more than a pool and someday I must drain the cup dipped in water's cool. So fare thee well, care for thy young and thy themselves once more that I am a man who's either making love or making war. Privation many nights and days I easily can bear. Normally that in the end, I'll gain a noble food, my share. That's his poem. It is also interesting. She goes, the author goes back to say, 
It is also interesting to discover that Antar took pride in his black pigmentation. He writes, in blackness, there is great virtue. If you will put observe its beauties, black American, um, ambergris has the purest fragrance. After his death in 615 AD, right, just under, uh, just over 100 years before the, uh, the conquer of Spain, the tradition of Antar spread because of the honor according his uh, celebrated career in writings. He was extremely uh, intelligent. He was, I mean, I'm sorry, celebrated career in writings. He was extremely intelligent and they found a lot of glory in his writing and perpetrated in song and stories through the efforts of a group of storytellers. So they're constantly talking about his greatness and his achievement. They're perpetuating. His disciples, who called themselves Antaristas, or Antaristas, I'm sorry, in the course of time, Antar legend and poetry flourished in the Eastern world, similar in manner to the tales of chivalry that took root at a later time in Spain and France, or the King Arthur legends in England. It was this uh, Antaristic tradition that entered the Iberia Peninsula with the Moorish invasion to form the base of many European romances of chivalry and later to influence the development of codes of chivalry of the European medieval period. In other words, they took his, his legend, they took all of his influences, they took it to Europe, and now Europe is beginning to develop because of an African, a mixed African. According to one scholar, the Antara was the most important of the Oriental origins of which some of our own Christian romances of the Middle Ages were founded. We know this. We know this. And here you have this author, Joseph Freher von Heimer Pirstall. He's German. I got to do that sometime. You know, von Heimer. <laughs> this is the work and not as is generally supposed, the thousand of one nights, which is the source of the stories which fill the tents and cottages in Arabia and Egypt. In this same context, he adds that the very spirit and substance of chivalry migrated with the Arabians from the east through Spain to Europe. A contemporary Spanish scholar and critic notes in his book on the Arab literature that the Atar tradition has a parallel in the cycle of stories based on the French hero Roland, and that this needs to be investigated further to verify the former's influence on the later epic poem, Song of Roland. Following Antar, Islamic Arabs who was recognized as black men were to contribute through Spain to medieval scholarships in literature which Europeans would utilize later. For example, there were Abu Dulama Ibn Duhan, a poet in the court of Baghdad in the 8th century. And this is, it's either said to be Zerabid or Zervab, depends better known to his contemporaries as the Black Nightingale, who arrived in Spain in 822 where he resided at the court in Cordova. Others were Ibn Dure, poet Abu Bakar, that should sound familiar to you, a warrior and poet, and Ben Sahid al-Maghribi, a geographer, traveler, scholar, poet, and a writer of note. Serious inquiry to, uh, into the lives and works of any of these men suggests the possibility of significant contributions that could be made in the scholarly field. A historical figure who further indicates the confluence of the Arab, African, and Spanish worlds in the early Middle Ages was Tariq. He was an African warrior converted 
to Islam when the Arabs moved across North Africa and was made a general to support Arab troops with his African army. The key word in all of that is converted. But we'll get to that in a little bit. When Tariq discovered the possibilities of invasion, he crossed over into Spain twice in 711, the second time in command of an army of 7,000 what? Africans that defeated the Gothic king of Spain, Rodrigo. He was later joined by Musa bin Nasiri, leading Arab troops to reinforce the victory. Together they pushed further into Spain, but the initial conquest belongs to Tariq and his Africans. Mons Capet, where Tariq had built an encampment and left a garrison to secure his communication with Africa was renamed Jabil Tariq by his troops in his honor. A name which meant Hill of Tariq. It was this name, Jabil Tariq, which later was transformed by the Spanish into Gibraltar. On the European continent, Literature, folklore, and fine arts bear out the historical reality. The Spanish language also reflects a cultural amalgam and existed nearly 800 years. Symmetricists might take note that the word for blackberry still is in use to, pres to present day Spain is mora. Feminine now, whose origin meaning is Moorish woman, and that the uh, uh, adjective for dark complexion. Later, involving into the meaning of brunette is Merino. That is Moorish. You see where this is going? that it is describing a complexion of a people. Right here in quotation, she says, during my own studies in Madrid, Spain, in the summer of 1970, I was often pointed out on the streets and in the parks as La Mora, or sometimes La Marina. There was no um, um, derogatory intent evidence simply that the more or moorish took precedence over the use of the word negro or feminine negra spanish adjective meaning black but you don't want to be called black you want to be called more like it like it takes away from it it is the same thing at this point a basic division in the concepts with reference to Africa and Africans must be indicated on the one hand, both in antiquity and especially during the Middle Ages. The image of Africa and Africans was generally characterized by respect, largely dependent on the fortunes of war. In Spanish literature, the African in the person of the Moor is usually of the ruling or upper classes. He is frequently characterized as a wealthy person or a learned person to whom Spaniards often went for counsel. So you so intrigued to keep going to Spain like they're just, they're so hot to diddy and so prestigious when in fact everything about them come from you. But the moment I tell you I'm going to Africa, you frown. But the moment I tell you I go to Spain, you smile with, with glee. It is absolutely insane. But I digress. Often he is pictured as greedy for wealth and power. But in any case, to be respected 
and more than likely admired even when he was the enemy. On the other hand, the 16th century marked a turning point. The Moors were expelled from Spain in 1492. That came from a lot of inner bickering too with the Arabs and everyone. A lot of infighting. Christianity triumphed in Europe at last. Moors folding back uh, on African soil after their defeat and route from Spain were a major factor in the sacking and breakdown of West African empires and civilization. For Europe, the way was open for the age of discovery and exploration initiated by Spain and Portugal. That was the result in the colonization and enslavement of Africa and, Af and opening up the Americas. As a result, the Africans and those of African descent came more and more to be depicted as what? Primitive, as savages, as slaves. Now you just finished civilizing these people. You just finished bringing music, poetry, science, means of travel, means how to cook, how to clean, you know, and etc. They turn around, defeat you because of inner bickering. You go back to Africa. They get their shells on the road. They come together other, other, the, under the Christian banner, and then they go back to Africa and now start trying to call you primitive and start trying to call you a savage and start trying to call you a slave and eventually begin to enslave you. But you just finished teaching them. African humanity was denied. In Western thought and literature, Africa became a curator for barbarism and backwardness and incapable of triumphing to the ongoing evolution of world civilization. Stemming from those two concepts and using the 16th century as a dividing line, the significance of Africa and Hispanic, um, uh, Hispanic culture becomes evident. That's why there's so much racism in Hispanic countries towards blacks. Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Mexico, Port um, uh, um, God darn, uh, Peru, Brazil, the list goes on. Serving to clear away the old myths, stereotypes and misinformation have pursued black men into the 1900s and held now into the 2000s. Literature and the, and the arts in Spain, as well as other European countries prior to the 16th century, substantiated the view of Africans in the elevated positions in Africa as a land that invoked both respect and curiosity. Statues of black kings and the paintings of black Madonnas can still be seen in European churches. The more noble and authoritative figure has literally has literally counterparts of which Shakespeare's Othello and the Moors of Titus Adrochinus are major examples. References to Ethiopians and their land as the land of the blacks and the symbol of learning and wealth. The legend and search for Prester John Mythical figure whom medieval Europe, fighting Islam, idolized as the image of black Christianity in Africa. The symbol of black St. Maurice in Germany are an indicative of the African image in Western consciousness as one point in history as the slave flooding the markets of Seville in Lisbon was becoming during the 1500s. Let me get you up to date real quick. St. Maurice is still considered one of the great saints, the Moorish saints in Europe. He was a Christian. So don't, don't forget, more is just a description of your, of your complexion. A Moor doesn't always determine if you're Muslim or Christian. You can be either one. It's all about a description of who you are. Second of all, remember, now you're in Portugal. Portugal 
is beginning to get themselves and start navigating on the west coast of Africa in the early 1400s. Well, 1440s, I'm sorry. They, are all, they already have slaves in their markets up there. Then they began going into Africa and setting up trade and trying to establish routes. So you had both Europeans coming in with under the banner of Christianity, and now you also have people uh, uh, um, uh, people coming from the Iberia Peninsula, and many of them was what? Uh, Sephardic Jews also. Up here on the right, a primary source for Spanish writers of Moorish themes is the work entitled Carrera Civilis de Granada by Gines Perez de Ajita. It describes the frontier wars between Moor and Christian that took place on Spanish soil. Dramatists and, and, um, uh, dramatists and poets used their book as a source for the colorful Moorish romances and frontier stories that became popular in the 16th and 17th centuries as Spain looked back to her past. One chapter tells of the exploits of a black name, Captain Forex, whose furious fighting gave him the reputation of being a hero in the region around Lorca. When a last forced to retreat, he burnt the fields around him and in the other ways attacked Christians who fell in great numbers or who were made slaves. In retaliation, the Christians tried to burn him alive, but according to the accounts, Black Captain Forax escaped and is said to have fled to Africa. Everybody keep fleeing flee to Africa. Moors, Hebrews, everybody keep going to Africa when they get in trouble. But you don't want no part of Africa. But you can't, as soon as you get in trouble, mysteriously, you back in Africa, though. <laughs> you know, you ain't in your own land. I ain't in Jerusalem somewhere. You in Africa, though. All right, the 16th century playwright Diego de Jimenez de Encisco is one of his plays modeled a character whom he called Canary on his personality. The black warrior Forex, um, I'm sorry, he called Canary on his personality, the black warrior Forex. Other Spanish writers, especially those of the 16th and 17th century, were to use similar episodes for the elaboration of the popular Moorish romances of the um, era. You have Margaret Sampson in her studies on El um, Caballero so far, all right? And Margaret Sampson, um, right here in quotation, Africa and Medieval Spanish Literature, that's what she wrote. So she did a Africa and Middle, Medieval Spanish Literature is, is uh, in the Bulletin of December 1969. So she notes down here, page 38, beginning of page 38, that in the prose romance of the chivalry dating back to the 13th century, Africa is often referred to either geographically or mythically. In addition, the work includes um, didactic tales and adventure um, de uh, stories which confirm the authoritative position of the Moor in the society of the time. Much the same can be said for the 14th century tales written by Don Juan Manuel in his masterpiece, Libro, uh, Libro de Conde Lucanor. The author utilizes his framework of a storyteller in his case, a counselor named uh, Padronio, who tells moral tales. Usually the Moorish protagonist to a, to, now here it is, the Moorish protagonist to illustrate solutions to problems that his that his master, the Count Lecanor, represents to him. So he's a problem solver. The stories spin on, many of them having their base and tales brought to Spain with the Moorish invasion. Advancing to the 16th century, a different kind of black personality marked Spanish literature. Moorish leaders and warriors had been routed and expelled. Those who were left were of a lower class and called moriscos rather than morals. So you went from being a morals, high and noble, to now you're moriscos. Now you're on the bottom, you're lower class after they had fall after you had fallen and, and, and ran out of Spain. They were poor agricultural laborers indeed to work in the fields of uh, Andalusia. 
They were often peddlers and vagrants who lived in their wits. A triumphant Spanish nobility learned to look down on this dark-skinned people. Uh, of course. Furthermore, slaves from Africa were being imported into Spain in increasing numbers. So for all you Spanish people out there who want to take so pride in being Spanish, uh, let me just remind you how much African blood you have in you. And I'm going to be doing a video on one of them particularly really soon. Because some of you with your arrogance, um, you know, tend to tend to not forget that much of your Spanish men still had an, an infatuation of black flesh and vice versa. Same thing with your Italians. Cities like Seville and Granada now became accustomed to associating blackness to with the inferior slave. Juan Latino stands out as a unusual representative of this new kind of black. That's why I don't understand why people are still sh shocked and awe about how there's still a, a division between um, black people and, and the Latin community. Because oftentimes black people who are growing up in a Latin community are still going to be persuaded as thinking like a Latin despite their being um, uh, pushed down on the, on the totem pole, just like here in the Americas. Because the ideology of racism is still at a, at a, at a high in Spanish-speaking countries. And I'm telling you the history right here, just as Mrs. Cobbs is writing. In 1528, he was brought from Africa, possibly Guinea, to Spain as a slave. Growing up in slavery, he adopted Christianity and learned Latin and Greek from the books of his master's son. Wow, so at least they was being taught. Eventually becoming the boy's tutor. He graduated from the University of Granada with honors in 1557 and was appointed a professor in the same university. He was so astounding, uh, outstanding in Latin that he reannounced his slave name to be called himself Juan Latino. He was received with acclamation and great respect by the Spanish people throughout a long life that spanned Spain's golden age. Both uh, Cervantes and Lope de Vega refer to him as used incidents from his life in his works. For the most part, Juan Latino expressed in his written works as a personality that was essentially Spanish in nature. Of course, it's culturally conditioned. He wrote like a white Spaniard with no central theme that concerned himself with his African origins nor with conditions of slavery that he not only must have witnessed, but must, him, but must himself have been subjected to. Does that not sound familiar? We still have those types of people now. His marriage to a white Spanish woman, noted and referred to by his writers of his time, served to enhance his position. Oftentimes people do that. They, they, they marry someone uh, outside their race in hopes that it pushes them up the totem pole. You do what you like. I'm just telling you what happens. His major literary work was the um, Australius, whose verses are a rudent in language and academic and style, revealing a patriotic commitment to Spain. Written in Latin, this work by this ex-slave Juan Latino celebrates the Spanish victory at the Battle of Lipato. The success of Juan Latino was achieved despite the fact that he was African. The price extracted was that he converted to Christianity, he cut loose from his African origins, and adopted the Spanish way of life. That sounds familiar quite often. By the Spanish standards, therefore, he was judged a worthy individual. You get rid of your ID, you get rid of your identity, you get rid of your culture, you get rid of your language, you get rid of your clothing, you adopt 
all the, the Euro center or the European um, ways of life, and now you are someone. Thus, the balance had tipped across Africa and in favor of Europe. The, um, the erudite Ethiopians, fierce Moorish warriors, black kings, knights and saints, the mysterious Prester John, all who had set standards of culture and chivalry on their own terms were disappearing from Western consciousness. Juan Lantino was himself symbolic of the new age. He was brought into Spain as a slave and he learned to read and master the Latin language through the indulgence of his owners. And for a while, the Moor was the linger on the Spanish literature through the popular Moorish romances of the 16th and 17th centuries that were the themes of such poets and, uh, and uh, dramatists as Lope de Vega, Luis de Gringora, Francisco de Quevedo, Lope de Buendo, and others. I don't speak Spanish, so forgive me if I completely destroyed it, but I'm doing my best. Hablo Espanol Pequito. That's it. All right. His bordo, his uh, border, um, de negros, for example, exaggerates. Now here it is. Go back. My man right here, Quavito. All right. No, uh, he often expressed a, 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 um, a, a duality in his concept. Now, check this out. Check this out. Look, look what my man writes. His Border de Negros, for an example, exaggerates and burlesque the blackness of a wedding party. The gestures and manners of the participants to the point of making fun of them. This is what your boy is writing, Juan Latino. To the point of making fun of them, ridiculing their blackness. On the other hand, in his La Hora they told us he expresses compassion for black slaves in his unfortunate condition. Oh, thank you very much. Gungora also demonstrates a dual point of view. He uses the speech patterns and jargon of 16th century blacks in creating images of their lower class lifestyle in some of his poetry and other poetry he goes back to the just to the tradition of medieval spain and retelling stories of interracial romances between african and spaniard and recreating the splendor of the chivalric code upheld by noble Mo and the noble moor and noble christian alike he this guy is telling you the interracial marriages between the two your dark hair Spaniards, your dark complected Spaniards. However, the effect of the Renaissance and the age of discovery and exploration, exploration in Europe were irreversible in literature. A new era opened up in 1492 in which men of African origin suffered the final collapse of their culture and their, um, um, and uh, dignities of chattel enslavement, which stripped them of their rights as human beings. So literature, through through literature, the early literature, through medieval literature, both by the Europe and the Spaniards, or just Europe period, was beginning to really destroy the image of the very same people that helped them get on their feet. Dr. John Herod Clark, you have no friends. The African, whether called Moor, Ethiopian, or Black, gradually disappeared from, from Spanish peninsular culture. Neither art nor literature took serious note of them. Royalty occasionally made him a court pet. Slaves were sometimes elevated to positions of trust in Spanish households or artist workshops. Even more significantly, in terms of New World history, they often served as right-hand men, guides, and explorers to Spanish conquerors as they advanced through forest, jungle, and Indian territory in both South and North America. Shout out to my man, um, the truth historian, when he taught me about the Nino brothers. 
They were that's why when the Mo, well, that's why when the Moors when they show you these fancy pictures, uh well look at this Moor haired rap standing beside um George Washington. Yeah, they was brought over here as what? I just told you. They was brought over here as right hand men, guides, and explorers. So when you see these pictures of people in their Moors garbs, these are your explorers. They were using you for the advancement of building the North and South America. So get off of that. Estevanico is just one example, exactly, of this breed of slave upon Spaniards in America depended. Sometimes references were made to the Moors past, but more often 16th and 17th century literature portrayed its black element as buffoons and rascals. Spain was too occupied with setting up a slave trade for pumping wealth out of their colonies to perceive the African as anything more than a subhuman species to be exploited. To continue to trace the literary presence of Africa and Hispanic culture, interested scholars must proceed to the Americas. Spanish American culture reveals that the African way of life found expression in folklore, uh, folklore in the um, centrism, uh, centrism of African religious practices with the Catholic Church, in music and in dance. Listen, Spanish American culture reveals that the African way of life found expression in folklore. And they combined it with what? Catholic church and music and dance and language, all of which would flower ultimately in the expression of black poetry of the Caribbean in the 1920s. Hit the wrong button, I apologize. An examination of this culture must be the subject of another paper. Meanwhile, a study of the concepts that mark the distance traveled from medieval blackamoor to present day blacks offer a valuable tool in understanding and defining the African heritage of African peoples in the 20th century, wherever they are located. The, dim the dimension of research in this field should be opened up to scholars and educators, channels for more study and dissemination of knowledge. And here you have Martha Kendrick Cobb, who contributed it, Afro-Arabs, Black Moors and Blacks, an inquiry into concepts through Spanish literature, completed her undergraduate work in MA in Romance Languages at Howard University. She studied abroad in France, Mexico, Spain, Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, and Africa, researching the African themes in Hispanic literature, a topic about which she also written and lectured. At Howard in, in early 1971, Mrs. Cobbs inaugurated and, pre and presently teaching in a program leading a postgraduate degree in the field of Afro, Spanish, and literature culture. Ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate you tuning in for another reading. I hope you got a lot out of this article. I know I get a little roused sometimes and I apologize for that, but it just is disgusting to see some people out there are really disingenuous in who they are. They don't want to admit their origins. They want to be anything except for who they are as African people. And if this, ar if this article wasn't clear enough for you, um, there's some books out there that um that I recommend, okay? And what I'll do is um what I'll end up doing, I can't, I'm, I'm looking for I'm looking for something right now, but what I'll end up doing, let me I'm going to post some books for you guys, um that that I would use as a reference for you to read, and and um please, order them, read them, read through this uh, read through the article with me again. 
definitely subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate you tuning in. So this, this means a lot. You're going to be getting the article reading every week on various subjects. And definitely stay tuned for my next video that I'm going to produce for you. So no further ado, I don't want to wait. I don't want to hold you up too, more, too much time. Download the channel. Subscribe to uh, download the uh, to download the app, the Dark Warrior Perspective app. Subscribe to the channel. Um, uh, definitely uh, go back, review this, and stay tuned for the books that I'm going to post in just one bit for you to for you to purchase. Okay, with no further ado, I say peace.